Welcome to the educational module for medications for opioid use disorder, presented by the UT Health Science Center at Houston, the HEROES Houston Emergency Opioid Engagement System Project under the Center for Health System Analytics at the School of Biomedical Informatics. The objectives of today's session are to review the basic overview of the disease of addiction, focus on the goals of medication-assisted recovery, discuss different medications used to treat opioid use disorder, provide insight into best practices surrounding medication therapy, and to highlight current barriers to treatment and medication access. It has been well established that addiction is a chronic relapsing disease that affects the brain and causes compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. So what we've seen is that substance use changes the brain's structure and function and therefore, even if the initial decision to use may have been voluntary, the impact of repeated use affects a person's self-control and ability to make future decisions. And therefore, the science supports addiction as a chronic and relapsing disease similar to other diseases, but that does mean that it can be managed successfully, and that's because the medical model is imperative to treating substance use disorders. Some of the basics here when we are talking about addiction and dependence. So dependence and addiction are very different. Dependence is that physical dependence on a substance where lack of a substance will initiate withdrawal symptoms. An example of this could simply be getting a headache after missing your morning cup of coffee. Addiction, on the other hand, is a clinical diagnosis of a substance use disorder. And so this is measured on a scale of mild, moderate, severe, looking at out of control use and continued use despite harm. And basically what we've seen is that substances start to replace other priorities in an individual's life and that can be measured and diagnosed on a clinical scale. What we do know is the science does support that opioid use disorder is a chronic disease and it has recurrence rates of substance use is similar to other chronic conditions, and it should be treated and evaluated long-term like any other medical condition. In that sense, there is no cure, but patients who comply with treatment regimens have much more favorable outcomes, and therefore medications for OUD should be thought of like any other maintenance medication, such as an inhaler for someone who has asthma. And a visual representation here when we are looking at recurrence rates of chronic disease, and we do see that drug addiction is in the same range when it comes to recurrence rates as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and asthma, just to name a few. So what is really going on in the brain and body when we're talking about substance use? So our baseline generally is that our brain body has opiate receptors all throughout our body and there are endorphins which are our naturally occurring opioids and these are kept in balance on our day-to-day -day routine. Now when we do something to change that balance such as flooding the brain with exogenous opioids that mimic natural endorphins, this confuses the system, and so its response is a few things. It first thinks that it's making too many natural endorphins, so it shuts that system down and it stops producing them. It also starts creating more receptors to increase the uptake because now that the system has been flooded with all of this substance, it has to do something with it. So it multiplies and adds a ton of receptors to respond to that increase. And therefore, prolonged use means that more receptors are now there in the brain and they need to be filled in order to produce that same effect. And so now what we're talking about here is tolerance. And so instead of the body being in uh, equilibrium, we've seen that it is completely dysregulated. And so there's too many receptors that are normally there and there's more of a substance that is coming in from the outside. Therefore, the body has stopped producing internal natural endorphins. And so this dysregulation takes a significant time to heal. So if we take that substance out, the body is going to go into a uncomfortable response because now it has a lot of these receptors that are wanting to be filled and there's nothing there to fill them. And the body is no longer making its own endorphins or natural opioids at this point. And so in order to help the body balance back out is where we see that medication for opiate use disorder is very 
very much evidence-based. So because addiction is a disease, it requires a medical model for treatment. And therefore it's not just reducing substance use, but it's an overall restoration of that individual to full functioning. And that may vary between individual. Long-term medication therapy for OUD helps people achieve long-term lasting recovery. And the research has shown over and over that detox and abstinence are correlated with high recurrence rates of active use. And therefore, somebody just going through the withdrawal and the detox of a substance that they've been taking is not enough to reset the brain and the body back to that equilibrium. And therefore, approved medications for OUD help with this process because they can create stability in the brain and help those damaged neural networks heal faster than abstinence alone. So what are the goals of medications to treat OUD? Obviously, we're looking for improved outcomes and reduction in mortality from overdose. So we want something that's ultimately going to save lives and prevent people from dying and overdosing due to the disease of addiction. Um, some of the other things that we're looking for is the prevention or reduction of withdrawal symptoms. So because the system is dysregulated, when somebody stops taking a substance, it takes their body some time to catch up and the withdrawal process can be very uncomfortable. And a lot of people have a hard time getting through that without medication assistance. And so one of the goals of medications is to help make that process a little more comfortable and manageable so that the body can detox without it being very disruptive to a person's day-to-day -day life. We also want to see prevention or reduction of substance cravings or drug seeking. And this is where medications to treat OUD are incredibly helpful beyond that withdrawal detox period because it also helps create that stability to allow the brain to heal without feeling like it needs a substance or is seeking a drug to balance itself back out. And so medications kind of sub in to those receptors and take that space so that the body can get used to not getting substances from the outside. We also want to see a prevention or return to active use, misuse of opioids. And so the goal, of course, is to prevent that recurrence rate of somebody going back out and engaging in active use. And if somebody is on a medication therapy, we've seen that the rates of recurrence are significantly lower. We also hope to restore physiological function that was disrupted by drug use. And so that's allowing the chemistry in the body and the routine of the body to balance itself back out and to find that equilibrium, which it will do. It just takes some time and medications make that process more comfortable. And it's also important to say that abstinence is not always the desired outcome here. So for some people, how long they stay on the medication and to what extent they decide to be enrolled in medication assisted treatment programs is going to vary. And we should not just be promoting the abstinence uh, as the only model, but instead should support a medical model that may vary between individuals in their situation. The main thing is also we want to get them stabilized to be able to enhance behavioral treatment. So if we are medically treating the disease of addiction behind the scenes, then it frees up the resources of that individual to be able to focus and engage in behavioral treatment. And there's a whole variety of, of different treatments and supports that can be paired alongside medication assisted treatment. So the biggest thing that we're talking about here is we wanna treat the disease of addiction medically. And it might seem counterintuitive to treat a narcotic-related problem with other narcotics, but the details of how these medications work differently is very important. So medications are weaker in effect, so they stimulate the brain more mildly, and that allows the brain and the body to level back out and find that equilibrium. We also want to make a point that physical dependence on mood is not the same as the disease of addiction. Mood is not replacing one drug with another. Being prescribed medications and taking them as prescribed is going to result in very different outcomes than somebody who continues to take illicit substances and put themselves and their health at risk. And there's a difference between the substances used to get high and medications used to get well. So one is very clearly paired with a lot of negative and harmful outcomes, including death. And the other is a medication regimen under the care of a doctor, and it's used to get themselves better and back on track and to improve their overall 
quality of life and satisfaction outcomes. So some terms here, there's a lot of acronyms in this field and one of the ones that we see is medication assisted treatment or MAT treatment or MAT therapy. And medication assisted treatment is the general term for any medication therapy for a substance use disorder. And so some of the examples could include the disulfiram for alcohol use disorder. They also use naltrexone for alcohol use disorder. We've seen bupropion and varenicline for nicotine tobacco use disorder. And there's also been some preliminary research about finding some other medications uh, such as modafinil for cocaine use disorder and other combinations for um, methamphetamine use disorder. And so the medication assisted treatment is that very broad term that can cover all types of medication treatment therapies for all types of substance use disorders. The focus of the rest of this presentation is going to be much more tailored and specific to the medications that are approved for opioid use disorder. And so the acronym there is MOOD, Medications for OUD. And some of the examples include methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone as the, the three main categories. It's not to say that that's an exhaustive list, but those are probably the most popular and readily available medications that are out in the field right now. So when it comes to mood and comprehensive treatment, we see that it provides a very important component of comprehensive treatment. And so again, because we're embracing that medical model and we're treating it with science and science-based uh, medication outcomes, it's still only one piece of the puzzle. And so medications for substance use are generally expected to be combined with other behavioral treatment and recovery support. And part of that is just that we're not relying on the medication alone for the outcomes, but we are using it as a comprehensive treatment to address and treat all aspects of somebody who is struggling with the disease of addiction. We also know that different types of medication may be useful at different stages of treatment to help with the withdrawal symptoms, to stay in treatment, and to prevent recurrence of use. And most important here is that individual treatment plans will vary. So there very much is not a one size fits all, and there's not just one pathway to recovery. We are very supportive of multiple pathways and whatever is working for the individual is a successful option for someone to be in that type of treatment. So some basic neuroanatomy just to set the stage here. So this is what we would see if we were to slice the brain in half and look at all the different regions. And you'll see that movement, sensation, vision, coordination, all of that is, is going on in the brain. When we are talking about the disease of addiction, we're actually talking very specifically about the reward pathway that's in the middle there. And so here we're seeing that the nucleus accumbens, the VTA, all of this is where the reward systems is happening. And this is where addiction is most impacting from the physiological part of the brain. And so when we say the reward system, we're talking about the part of our brain that is our most primitive, and it's tied to a lot of the things that we would consider to be survival based. And so the reason that, uh, you know, we seek out air, water, food, anything that keeps us going, that's our brain that has been conditioned over and over that these things are good, do them again. And that model can be hijacked when we start putting substances into the brain that aren't there naturally. And so when we're talking about substance use disorders, it impacts that same reward pathway in the brain and hijacks it and basically convinces the brain that if I don't continue to use substances, I will die. And so that's where we talk about the science of what's changing when somebody repeatedly has used substances over a period of time is the brain actually starts to function and behave differently. And that pathway that keeps us alive and healthy and surviving is now following the wrong path of wanting to chase the substance and clearly believing that if I don't get it, I will not exist anymore. 
And so when we're talking about opiates, we have opiate receptors all over the brain. So even though the reward pathway is what's being activated, all of those little receptor sites that we talked about um, that appear when we start flooding the system with opiates, these receptors start um, you know, multiplying and, and creating more of them, and they're all over the brain. And not only are they in the brain, we also know that our opiate receptors are in the brain, the spinal cord, the digestive tract, and, and kind of throughout our entire body with the peripheral neurons. And when you think about this, it actually makes a lot of sense when you look at what withdrawal symptoms are with someone who's struggling with opiate use disorder. And when they're in withdrawal, they're reporting headaches, back pain, digestive issues, goosebumps, um, just to name a few. And when you start seeing that the whole body is responding to that withdrawal, that is because there are receptors all over the body and they're in withdrawal and they're uncomfortable and it's registering that lack of a substance and the body is responding in a very physical manner. So shifting gears here to the psychopharmacology. So this is where we wanna look at the physiological effects of opioids. And this is just to set the stage. Generally, when we're talking about opioids, we're talking about them having an analgesic effect. And analgesic is just the fancy word for pain. It's pain relief. And so when we're talking about the effect of opioids, we're talking about pain relief. For a lot of people, they also experience euphoria. This is not a universal response. But for most people, they report pain relief, euphoria. We will see pupillary constriction, that respiratory depression happening. And that's one of the biggest contributing factor to overdose is when that respiratory de depression occurs, then oxygen's not getting to the brain and the body. And that's what's leading to overdose. It also has a immunosuppressant effect. So it suppresses the immune system when somebody's on opioids for a while. And so that's gonna have an impact on someone's overall health. And it also decreases gastrointestinal motility. So to clarify, opiates are naturally occurring, and this is generally like your opium, your, hero, your heroin, and opioids are all. So that's including the synthetics and semi-synthetics, pills, et cetera, everything that's the, the big catch-all. So opiates are those natural occurring things. It's also why we refer to a lot of things in the brain and body as opiate receptors because they respond to some of our natural opiates that occur in our bodies. And opioids is that catch-all for everything else. And so opioids is usually the, the term that comes up the most, just to be the most inclusive. And now we want to break down some of the special properties of opioids and OUD medications. And so we've got three main categories here. You've got your agonist, your antagonist, and your partial agonist antagonist. And we're going to talk about all three next. So an agonist is a drug that activates a receptor in the brain. Full opioid agonists activate opioid receptors completely, resulting in a full opioid effect. So they cause an action, and the biggest action that they cause is that analgesic effect, that pain relief that we talked about. And some examples of agonists include heroin, oxycodone, methadone, hydrocodone, morphine, opium, and others. Now we also have something that's called an antagonist, and an antagonist is a drug that blocks a receptor in the brain. And therefore, because they're blocking the receptor, there is no pharmacological action that's happening. So there is no effect, but they do knock off any opiates that are already in there. So if there's already opioids in the system, it will knock them off the receptor, and then it will basically just block that receptor so that nothing else can go in there. And part of that is if you do have other opioids in your body, it will trigger, trigger an effect of precipitated withdrawal symptoms. And it's a very uncomfortable process because what you've done is create a shock to the system. So everything was filling receptors and feeling good. And when you put in that antagonist, it kicks off. So you lose that pain relief effect and now you're blocking it, but you're also causing instant withdrawal symptoms. And some of the main antagonists that we're gonna talk about here today include naloxone and naltrexone. 
We've also got a partial agonist, and this can be referred to in a couple of different ways. Sometimes it's called agonist antagonist. Others call it partial agonist. Basically, what we want to take away here is that they have both properties of that agonist that's causing an action and that antagonist that's blocking those receptors. So it activates opioid receptors, but to a much lesser degree than a full agonist. It also has a ceiling effect, meaning that after a certain dosage amount, that potency in the brain does not increase. And so there's a plateau effect, meaning that after a certain amount of a partial agonist, there's no additional clinical effect. So you can't keep building and building. After a certain point, there's no longer a medical or clinical benefit from taking more of that same medication. And it also acts as an antagonist, and so it blocks receptors from other opioids. So in addition to partially activating that receptor, it's also blocking anything else from coming in. And if you do try and put something else in, it has a greater affinity, meaning that it will kick anything else off of those receptors and precipitate withdrawal. And so it has a, a very diversion effect to um, discourage wanting to use on top of it because the brain's not going to respond to the substance in the way that somebody might be hoping that it will. And the most common partial agonist that we talk about is buprenorphine or the buprenorphine naloxone combo. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And I really like this graphic because it's very visual about what these three categories are actually doing in the brain. So all three work to reduce or block the effect of opioids. So in that sense, they're all very similar but uh, they do interact differently. And so the example of methadone, that's that full agonist. It's gonna fully occupy that receptor and it's like a key to a lock. And so it fills it like a bucket. And then buprenorphine is kind of more sprinkled on that receptor, so it does not completely bind and fill. And it kind of acts as that filter, so it's activating it a little bit and it's blocking anything else from coming in. And then you've got that naltrexone. It is a non-narcotic and all it does is block the receptor. So there's no interaction, there, there's no response, there's no effect, and it does knock off anything that's there and prevents anything else from crossing that barrier. And what's really important here is all of these medications are longer acting medications and have a greater affinity to the opioid receptors. So most of the illicit substances out there that people are using are very short term and short lasting. And so when we've got a medication that's coming in, that's where it creates that stability. So where illicit substances are creating that high peak and fall because of the short acting nature, medications come in, these are long acting, and, and therefore the effect on the brain is much more stable and constant over time. So what is the right dose? This is one of those questions where it's more of an art, not a science, and it depends on many factors. It depends on the individual, it depends on metabolism, it depends on history of use, it depends on other health conditions and other medications. And there really is not a one size fits all when we're talking about medications for OUD. And so we're going to present some information on the next few slides about some average starting induction and maintenance process of these medications, but there is not a one size fits all. It's really about what's working and what's not working. And so having enough of the medication for that into individual to experience a positive effect and to be doing well in their recovery is the desired outcome and not focusing so much on what's a high dose or a low dose, but looking more on what the outcomes are. But for those unfamiliar with these medications, I do think it's important to break down what it looks like when somebody's starting these types of medication therapies. And so all of these, you're going to have that initial dose and the range can vary of that dose. But on average, a lot of people on methadone are started on that 20 to 40 milligram dose. And this is going to be enough to relieve the abstinence symptoms. 
And after we've started the body on a methadone maintenance program, then there's some trial and error to figure out where the long-term maintenance dose is going to be. And so it usually involves increasing or decreasing over a period of time to get to a point where the individual tolerance level is, is surpassed and therefore their brain is no longer craving and seeking something. And so it's putting enough into the system to help that brain uh, reach that equilibrium and stabilize back out. And that dose is going to vary for everybody. And once you've got kind of late induction going on here, you're starting to narrow in, you're seeing the desired effects, then you get to a point where it's maintenance. So now we found whatever dose is, is working for that individual and we wanna keep them there. And so a lot of it will fall between that 60 to 120 milligrams, but I wanna be very clear that it can be less than 60 and it can be much greater than 120 milligrams when we're talking about what's working for the individual. And again, it goes back to all of the different factors and it really is an art more than it is a science because um, nobody responds exactly the same to the same medication regimen. And so this is just a brief overview of where we start with kind of a standard dose and then we balance up or down and try and find uh, the number that's going to work for that person. And that's based on the tolerance level being exceeded to stop those cravings, to have somebody experiencing positive effects in their day to day and being able to function and get back to that full restoration of the individual. So when we're talking about buprenorphine medication management, and again, the same guidelines here, these are kind of average rough estimates, but there's not a one size fits all when we're talking about buprenorphine either. And so that initial dose usually falls somewhere between eight to 12 milligrams dosing on that first day. And with buprenorphine, there is kind of a timing effect that goes into it. So buprenorphine is standard um, taken when somebody has already started the initial withdrawal process. So there's clinical opioid withdrawal scales that are measured and having a length of time from their last use of opioids before you would start somebody on a medication management. And so it can be at least 12 to 24 hours for most people before natural withdrawal is starting to kick in. But depending on the route of administration and the history of use, sometimes natural withdrawal will not kick in until 36 hours or even greater than that for some people. And so for each individual, they should be uh, medically consulted by their physician to understand where that window is to start medications. And then based on that initial starting point, going through the same process as you saw with the, the methadone is we've got to reach that tolerance level. And so prescribing enough of that medication and taking enough of that medication for the, the cravings and the drug seeking to go away and then trying to figure out what that uh, adequate dose is going to be long-term. And it can take a few weeks to stabilize on an adequate dose. And so this process is not just very streamlined of it just, oh, just prescribe and go. Some of it is some trial and error, listening to the patient, getting reported feedback, and understanding if they need more or less based on what they're reporting and the outcomes that they're experiencing. Most individuals fall in that 8 to 16 milligrams daily, and so that's, again, an average. It can be higher than that or lower than that, depending on the person. What's different here is buprenorphine does have a clinical ceiling, meaning that after 24 milligrams daily, the the evidence and the research has shown that there's no longer a clinical effect. And so after 24 milligrams, it is not a great use of extra medication because you're not increasing the response from the brain and the body any more than you would be at the 24 milligrams. What we do see a lot of people here is sometimes the dependence on the medication is still an extension of the disease of addiction and it's more psychosomatic that they're thinking they need to take more and want to take more and that's really where we find that when someone on a high dose of buprenorphine they benefit a lot more from having those behavioral treatment and therapies alongside so that they're not just relying on the medication to achieve their recovery outcomes, but that they're building a very inclusive model of uh, coping skills, problem solving, thinking skills, um, 
and, and just trying to be solutions based and, and manage day to day life and not just expecting a medication to do that. It's also, uh, there's another strategy out there with the buprenorphine medication induction. It is called microdosing, and it's the Bernays method. And it's not as popular yet, and it might be because it's a little more involved with the physician-patient monitoring and interaction. But what that would look like is somebody starting on a very, very low dose of buprenorphine and taking it alongside the continued use of opioids and then slowly increasing the buprenorphine and alongside slowly titrating or decreasing the opioids and doing it so over a phased out period of a couple of weeks to avoid the buprenorphine being taken too close to opioids where it would kick somebody into that precipitated withdrawal and therefore it's kind of a slow and steady of raising the medication and lowering the opioids and it is available and some physicians choose that method and find it to be very helpful and it's just not as popular as the standard that we've seen for most places of waiting until a patient is in withdrawal and then being able to start medication management right there. But there are more than one way to start buprenorphine medication and I just wanted to mention um, similar methods. And this is just kind of elaborating on that tra uh, transition to buprenorphine. And so if you take it too early, it can be problematic and uncomfortable and also be discouraging for someone who's trying to transition out of active use and into a medication assisted regimen. And so that timing and helping the patient understand is very important. What is good about the buprenorphine is it can be started in an emergency room or at a clinic. It can be started in a doctor's office uh, where methadone is often just prescribed at a lot of methadone-based clinics. Buprenorphine can be a little more inclusive to induction in various settings and from various types of physicians. We do see that any of your medications, it's important to have a full exam, assessment, and medical consultation and always having that conversation about where, when their last use was, how much were they using, were they using any other substances, and trying to figure out what a good starter dose and time frame for that starter dose is going to look like. So the most popular combination of medication out there is buprenorphine and naloxone combined together. And this is used as a diversion technique. And so that naloxone is at such a small dose that it's pretty much dormant when you're taking the medication as prescribed. And if you're trying to take it in a route of administration or take it not as prescribed, then that naloxone kicks in and precipitates withdrawal. And so this is used as a diversion technique and therefore it'll prevent those euphoric effects if the medication is not used in the manner that it is intended to be used. And it will block opioid receptors and initiate withdrawal if other opioids are taken. And that's the other um, discouragement that medication has from using and going back to active use is because when you have this medication in your system, it's not going to respond well to other opiates coming in. So while they may be chasing that euphoria, that rush, that high, the science of the chemistry in their body is going to prevent that from happening and actually make it very uncomfortable. And uh, that's why it's helpful for the buprenorphine naloxone combo to be prescribed. So the naloxone is dormant if it's taken the way it's supposed to be, but if it's act it is activated if somebody tries to inject it to uh, misuse the medication and then it plays a role in preventing that experiencing from being enjoyable and therefore discouraging that from happening again. So with the buprenorphine, it's also very important to discuss medication interactions. And so because it is a prescribed medication, it's always very important to know what other medications or other things that a patient may be taking. And the biggest concerns are buprenorphine, alcohol, and benzodiazepines. These do not play well together, and they have a very severe medication interaction. 
and if you're taking them together it has an impact of increasing the adverse effects of sedation overdose and unfortunately even death and so anyone who is prescribing a controlled substance like buprenorphine they are counseling patients and making sure that they're not drinking alcohol as well as they're not being prescribed benzodiazepines. And this is where co-occurring and dual diagnosis is very helpful because we do see that benzodiazepines are prescribed a lot for mental health purposes. And therefore it's a bigger conversation to make sure that somebody who's entering a medication therapy regimen for opiate use disorder is also taking into consideration the needs and the medications that they have for their mental health and trying to find the best combination of medications that will work to address both issues. And so the big ones, like I said, that we want to make sure we're counseling and having conversations and, and checking other prescribing that might be going on is because buprenorphine, alcohol, and benzos can be very problematic. So now we've got that third category that we talked about, the naltrexone, and that falls into that antagonist category. And this is medication that can be used following complete detoxification. So because of its ability to block that receptor and to kick out any opioids that might be in the system, it's very important that somebody starting a naltrexone regimen has already completely detoxed from the opioids that they've been taking. And so because of this, you see an abstinence period of seven to 10 days before induction can occur. And so this one, um, it also is used as MAT for alcohol use disorder as well. So alcohol and opioids, because they do function on similar receptors, they uh, both benefit from this type of regimen. It comes in a pill or oral form and it can be taken daily. It also comes in a 28-day injectable shot for extended release, meaning that you would only have to come back and see your physician every 28 days. And naltrexone is one of those that is paired a lot with the criminal justice populations. And part of that is because usually we've seen that detox period already happen and occur when they're in that setting. And therefore getting somebody started and set up on this, it just pairs much better as an option because they've already gone through that detox period. Of course, it doesn't mean that it's exclusively for that population, but we have seen that it is paired more often with populations that have already gone through the detox period, and that happens to be one that um, fits the bill. All of the medication regimens that we're talking about here, we have to stress that accountability is a part of the process. And so most of these are looking at regular toxicology screens to ensure that one, the medication is present and therefore whatever they're being prescribed is actually being taken and consumed and is not being diverted. The other thing we're looking for is the absence of other substances. And that's to avoid those drug interactions that we talked about. Um, and all substances are not equal on this front, and so everything that shows up on a talk screen should be reviewed and discussed um, between the patient and physician to determine which ones may be problematic and which other substances that may be in their body are not causing harm. And it's... Talk screens are generally used to measure compliance with treatment to make sure that somebody is on track and that things are working. What we do see is the response to talk screens that uncover substances. Um, the response can vary between physician and between clinics and between their clinical teams. And it's just really important for the physician and clinical team to work together to determine adjustments to treatment plan. And whether that's upping accountability, if something shows up that is concerning or possibly referring to higher levels of care when an outpatient medication regimen is not working for someone they, and they might need more help and assistance to be able to uh, get into the long-term recovery. So what is the length of time that someone should be on mood? And this is another one of those. There's not a one size fits all. We have seen that um, there's a couple of timelines that have popped up. What's happening in the body after someone has gone through withdrawal. So the physical withdrawal from a substance is acute withdrawal. 
when we're talking about post-acute withdrawal syndrome, that's what the body and the brain are doing behind the scenes to adjust. And if you're talking about pause or post-acute withdrawal syndrome, we're talking about 18 to 24 months for the body and the brain and emotions and physical and biological responses and everything to find some of that equilibrium. And so it is recommended to stay on mood for a length of time to provide your brain and your body that chance to balance itself out before taking that safety net of medication away um, if it is appropriate for some people. Again, there's not a one size fits all and there is a small segment of people who will choose to be on mood for the rest of their lives because that's what works for them and, and allows them to be happy and allows them to be productive and functioning and there for their families and relationships and all of the things that we would consider satisfactory outcomes. We do know that safety is important, and so any long-term medication regimen is usually going to be paired with uh, annual blood work, liver function tests, just to make sure that there's not any strain being created in the body um, or that there's not anything else going on that makes it unsafe for someone to continue mood treatment. There is the option of medical tapering when appropriate, and that's available for all of the medications we've talked about. So there is a, a right way and a wrong way to get off of a mood medication management. And that's, again, going back to the idea of dependence. When somebody is being prescribed a medication long term over time, the body is adjusted and used to having that medication. And if the decision is made to take that medication away, we don't want to stop anything abruptly because that will cause a shock to the system. And so there is a medical tapering process for all of them to kind of ease the body out of expecting that medication and lowering the dose and trying to eliminate that shock to the system and avoiding withdrawal that's severe from the medication that they've been taking. And it's not a one size fits all, so the length of time may vary. Some people may be on it short term, some people will choose to be on it long term, some people will fall in the middle, and some people may choose to be on it the rest of their lives. And so it's all about that physician and patient conversation about determining what they're trying to accomplish and what they need to be able to achieve that. We have seen barriers to mood treatment. And some of the things that we've seen is that there is a low percentage of providers compared to the need that is out there. And there's a variety of studies and analyses and research that exists out there. But the stark reality is about 80 to 90% of patients who are in need of treatment are unable to access substance use treatment. And that's a very concerning number where the majority of people who need it can't get it, can't get it quickly, are put on wait lists, don't have access in their area, transportation. There's a lot of things that can be problematic when somebody's trying to access care. The other thing that comes into play is the cost of medication. So all of the medications have varying costs and the different programs and state funded options are going to vary as well as the wait lists for funded treatment slots are going to vary depending on on the need and the eligibility to access state funded options but cost is still a huge barrier and prevents many people who are in need of the treatment and who may have lost everything due to their disease of addiction it makes it very hard for them to access care if they don't have the the money to be able to afford some of these treatment options there's also still a lot of misunderstandings about addiction and medication-assisted treatment from family, friends, society, providers. There's just a lot of stigma and myths out there, and it's very important that we do our best to understand the science behind these types of um, the disease of addiction, the medical model, and the medications that have been proven over and over to lead to more successful outcomes. And we want to do everything that we can to knock down those myths and to eliminate some of that stigma. And education is one of the biggest ways that we can do that. And it's worth saying again, the abstinence only pathway is um, still very prevalent out there and isn't the only pathway. It works for some people. People have been very successful in that route, 
but there's also a lot of people who have not been able to make abstinence only be successful for them. And so having the medication assisted treatment options is crucial to allowing those who are not able to just cold turkey, quit a substance and never pick it up again, to have an option that is evidence-based and is becoming the gold standard to treat the disease of addiction. There's also just some other information to consider here. Um, the system itself is flawed and I think it's okay to acknowledge that because that's how we decide that some things aren't working and we want to find alternatives and to do better. And right now we have in many, uh, many advanced practitioners, physicians, dentists, all of these types of people that can prescribe opioids and currently only highly regulated methadone clinics or rigorously trained physicians are able to prescribe the medications that are used to treat opiate use disorder. And I think that that's very problematic because we've potentially created that barrier of accessing um, the treatment to something else that can be very readily prescribed and is out there. And the system itself needs to make some adjustments and respond to that. The cost of the medication treatment we talked about is very expensive. Wait lists are very long. Access to care, rural areas, city areas, places where public transportation is not an option, places where um, they're going to multiple places to get their uh, substance use treatment, their mental health treatment, their doctor treatment. So they're going to multiple providers just to get all of their needs met. There's just a lot of room for improvement and the regulations still need to be more responsive to the need for access to evidence-based treatment modalities. And there's room for improvement in that. Now, naloxone, or what we know as the brand name Narcan, is not a treatment therapy, so it's, it's not an approved medication for opioid use disorder, but I think it is worth mentioning in this presentation because we do know that naloxone save lives. It comes in a couple of different formats. It can be injection or nasal spray. And what naloxone does is it has a greater affinity for those opiate receptors in the brain. So again, naloxone is qualified as that antagonist. So it's going to go in there. It's going to kick off any opioids that are on those receptors and prevent any of those opioids from coming back in. And so essentially what that does is it reverses the effects of the opioids and one of the big things we talked about is that respiratory depression that is paired with overdose it's going to reverse that effect and so oxygen is going to start getting to all the the organs and and the lungs and the heart and reverse the effects of an overdose what's important to note though is it is a temporary effect because the opioids are still present in the system and that naloxone is going to wear off. And if those opioids are still in the system, they can reattach to now the empty receptors that no longer have a barrier. And somebody could go back into that respiratory depression and still be at risk of overdose. And so after administering naloxone, it's very important to call 911, follow through with medical evalu evaluations, make sure that somebody is truly in the clear and that you haven't just temporarily prevented the overdose just for the opioids that are in the system to come back and cause problems. It has been shown with numbers of studies that naloxone does save lives, but it is important to know that it is an acute intervention and it's not treatment. And so to reinforce that idea that detox or getting somebody um, back from an overdose and preventing them from dying is one piece of what the process needs to be when we're responding to an overdose. It's going to provide that acute, instant intervention, save that life, but without connecting someone to treatment, and whether that's medication-based or behavioral-based, without treatment, that naloxone is really just a Band-Aid to the bigger problem of someone who is struggling with the disease of addiction. And so it's crucial, it's helpful, everyone should get it and carry it and have it just in case because it does save lives and it's not treatment and we want to make sure that we're using the intervention option from somebody who has recently overdosed and been brought back and pairing that alongside comprehensive care and treatment so that we don't miss an opportunity to truly help somebody enter into recovery. So to summarize all of this, 
We've shown addiction is a brain disease and it really requires a medical model to treat. It's so important to acknowledge that there are many pathways to recovery. It is not a one size fits all and not every model is going to work effectively for every individual patient, but the pathways and working alongside a clinical team and a support team to be able to determine what's going to work for each individual is crucial. If that process is going to include medication options, there are multiple medication options available to patients who have OED. And medication therapy as a component of comprehensive treatment has been associated with high success rates for long-term recovery. So those that have entered into medication therapies have found that the success rates are a lot higher than some of the other models to get there, but it is not a one-size-fits-all and always worth re-highlighting that complete abstinence is not always the goal of medication therapy. It really is looking at restoring individual functioning and quality of life and, and living in satisfaction and health, getting those things back to some place that's good, and that's how we want to evaluate treatment and care. And with that, I just want to say thank you. And if you have any questions or comments, you are welcome to go to our website for more information and refer any questions about this presentation or opioid use disorder treatment in Texas to the email that is listed on your screen. Thank you.